Welcome to the Unhurried Living Podcast. We're sharing leadership conversations to help you develop unhurried rhythms of rest and work. We're helping you overcome hurry and make time for what matters most. And now, enjoy today's episode. Hey friends, welcome to episode 239 of the podcast. My name's Alan and I'm so glad you've joined me here. I'm hopeful that our time together will help you rediscover an unhurried way of life and leadership. As the 2023 season begins, I'm pleased to be talking with Jen Pollock Michelle about her latest book, In Good Time. As I read it in preparation for today's conversation, I had so many amen moments. I'm grateful for Jen's deep rooted and wise message about unhurried time. Jen Pollock Michelle is a writer, speaker, coach, and podcast host. She is the author of five books A Habit Called Faith, Surprised by Paradox, which was a winner of Christianity Today's 2020 Award of Merit for Beautiful Orthodoxy, Keeping Place, and Teach Us to Want, which was the winner of Christianity Today's 2015 Book of the Year. She holds a B.A. in French from Wheaton College, an M.A. in Literature from Northwestern University, and is working to complete an M.F.A. from Seattle Pacific University. After 11 years of living in Toronto, Jen now lives in Cincinnati with her husband and her two youngest children. Now, if you're a new listener, welcome to the podcast. If you find these episodes helpful, please follow, rate, and review. And be sure to share this podcast with your friends. Meanwhile, let's now dive into my conversation with Jen Pollock Michelle. On today's Unhurry Living podcast, I'm pleased to have Jen Pollock Michelle, author of In Good Time. Thank you, Jen, for joining me for this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it, Alan. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I would love to just begin uh, this conversation about your book by asking if you could share something of the journey uh, you took in coming to write it, because it's a personal book. It's a very personal book. Yeah, it's set against the pandemic, for sure. That's a, a major context of the book is just to think about how my own expectations of time were turned upside down yeah. and what I could do in time and how I could exist in time. I think and it, that wasn't just true for me. It was true for everyone. I think it's pretty safe to say every single person probably on the planet. And, so, you know, we all experienced a disruption and certainly a disruption to our expectations of time and of ourselves in time. And I think the other thing that is really critical to the book is telling the story of learning that my mom was ill. Mm. Um, I tell some of that story, but I finished writing the book before I knew exactly what was happening with her. I could see a cognitive, some cognitive issues. She was still at the time married to uh, my stepfather who had had Parkinson's. He actually died after the book was published just this, just this past May. Oh, wow. And then in August, of this year, we received the diagnosis that she does in fact have Alzheimer's. So that meant a big move for our family and really wow. grappling with, you know, what it meant to embrace the responsibility to, first of all, fear the Lord. And then because I feared the Lord to, to just honor my my parents and my dad yeah. died when I was 18. So it's, and my brother died actually in my twenties. So it's really just me. Mm. And feeling that the weight of that responsibility and grappling with it, really, because I think in so many ways, I'm like other people. I want an uninterrupted life. I want mm -hmm. to kind of be able to pursue the things that I want and aspire to do. And, you know, I'll I'll happily help you so long as it's on my list for the day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. I understand. Um, so, yeah, so I would say those are the kind of the primary context. And then I think just out of that story, coming into, you know, real questions about how, what are my distorted, where did I receive this, dis, these distorted expectations yeah. of what 
time owes me? Um, how do I come into a better story as a Christian, you know, to really believe? I mean, if God is from everlasting to everlasting, there must be some time plenty that I'm not yeah. aware of. Um, and so I think just coming to those questions as a Christian with a Bible in hand, you know, my story, living my story, but, you know, living it through Christian discipleship and just trying to come to some better, a better understanding, a more faithful understanding, really. And I mean, faithful as in practicing faithfully, but also full of faith, you know, yeah. a story of time. Absolutely. Well, I love the phrase you just used, uh, time plenty. Is most of us, I think, probably identify with feelings or experiences of what is more like a time scarcity. That's what we imagine. I don't have enough time. I need more time. Uh, can you talk some about what you've been learning about this, maybe this kingdom vision of time plenty? Mm hmm. Well, it's interesting because I'm preparing Psalm 90 for a couple of speaking engagements. And I think that's oh, yeah. such a beautiful meditation that on the one hand invites us into a vision of time plenty. You know, I just quoted from it from everlasting to everlasting. You are God yeah. before the mountains were formed or you brought forth the earth and the world, you know, from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Lord, you've been our dwelling place from all generations. So there's this affirmation of 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 God existing beyond time, you know, and not suffering time as we do, but certainly the Psalm gives us this articulation of what it means to suffer time that, you know, gosh, we're given such brief years, you know, 70 and maybe 80 Moses right. says, you know, yes. if we're really, you know, really, really favored. And yet they sort of come to an end with a sigh, their span is toil and trouble and so I think there really is a both and that the Bible is giving us as it so often is, you know, it's often allowing us to inhabit attention um, because on the one hand, God is not bound by time and he's writing a story that, you know, is so much bigger and longer than one particular lifespan. I love how that Psalm in particular talks about the generations. And then yeah. at the, as the Psalm ends, the psalmist says, you know, let your work and your power be shown to your, to our children. You know, so this idea that yes, our lifespans are brief and we suffer that. And yet that's no hindrance to God. Um, so I think, what am I learning? You know, I think on the one hand, I, I, I am grappling more realistically with time scarcity in the sense that mortal time is brief. Hmm. And the Bible paints that picture for us in the, with these images that, you know, just get emblazoned on our mind, you know, that we're grass that flourishes and flowers in the morning and then fades and withers in the afternoon, you know, that um, a thousand years can be swept away as with a flood, like a dream. And so we do suffer that, you know, and we have to grapple with the fact that we don't get as much time as we want. You know, I tell a story in the book of actually talking to my contractor in Toronto who came over the day he thought he had um, incurable cancer. Mm. He actually had a misdiagnosis. So it turns out that he doesn't have cancer, but he I'm talking to him on the day that he thinks he's not going to live to see his grandchildren, you know, get older. Um, and he was just crying, you know, and he said, take an arm, take a leg, but just give me more time. And I thought, oh gosh, isn't that so true? You know, we all want more time. And I think we long for it because we're not made for death. You know, when we think about the garden, this idea that, you know, we were permitted at one point to just keep eating from the tree of life that with God, God was inviting us into that gift. And then that gift <laughs> By our own choice, our own desire to turn away from the giver of the gift of life, you know, our lives are cut short. Um, but I think for kingdom people, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, it's like, oh, that takes all the panic out of life, doesn't it? Yes. I don't. 
have to worry that my life will be too short for what God intends. Whatever God intends for my life, it'll be exactly the right amount of time. And whatever God intends, and you can think of that in the mo- in the broadest sense, you can think of it at, at your lifespan. It will be sufficient for whatever God means it to be for. And then shrink that down into today mm. and this hour and this minute. It's sufficient for whatever God has called us for. And I think that invitation into to that peace is what I'm seeking to lean toward. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I wonder too, maybe as I'm listening to you, you know, maybe one of the ways God would give us more time if we need to use that kind of a sentence yeah, is by, you know, is by helping us experience the moments a bit more fully than we sometimes Mm. do. You know, there's so much distraction, there's so much hurry. And I think, you know, you talk about that. Um, Can you talk some about that idea of just being present in the moments we do have and how that might be a kind of time plenty for us? Mm -hmm. There's this wonderful phrase, and I'm not going to get it exactly right, but I talk about how Kathleen Norris, a poet, um, was teaching in a fourth grade classroom. And I don't even remember what word they were defining, but this fourth grader basically talks about the idea of your soul catching up with your body. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And I think that's so right. I think that's so apt. I think that the way that we live through time and move through time, it's like our bodies are just, they're like in furious motion. And then like our souls, and of course, you know, I'm using this very metaphorically, but like our souls are just kind of lagging behind, like, wait up, hold on. (laughs) Can can I, can you just hold on a second? I want to, I want to catch up with you. Yes. Um, So one of the things that one of the practices that really helped my soul to catch up to my body was actually starting to pray the hours. And I talk about that in uh, a little bit in the book. I really honestly probably should have given it a little bit more airtime because the more I talk about it, I think, yeah, I think it was that practice that was a Mm. beginning for me to pause during the day and to just kind of breathe. And to actually resist some of that urgent, furious motion of my body, you know, like, because we are put into motion by the panic of I've got more to do, you know, this, uh, these, this day is going to be too short for my list, my to do's and literally just sitting down, opening my prayer book, which I actually have right here. Um, Oh, yeah. And divine hours, it looks like. Oh, divine hours. It's a wonderful it's just, resource. Oh, it's it's so beautiful. I mean, honestly, before we got onto this podcast, you know, just being reminded of the prayer that we're praying for this week. Oh God, mm. who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature. Oh, you know, yes. What a Christmas prayer. And I think that this idea of like letting finding. I don't even want to say finding moments. I think it's, I think the language is very important. I don't think we make the time for these moments for our soul to catch up with our body, because that would just assume like I'm in control of time, which I'm not. We have to, I think, really think like the monks and the nuns, we observe the time, the time, like the time is now, you know, and that's why we have habits and practices that we hopefully structure our lives around that call us to these things, whether or not we feel like we're in the mood for it, whether or not we have gotten everything done. In fact, this morning for me was very, it just, you know, I had my list and then Uh it just went out the window um, for a variety of reasons. But these, the present moment Like, I don't even think we can practice the presence of this moment until we actually do observe time where we allow our souls to catch up with our bodies. You know, that can be praying the hours that can be um, for me. Another important thing that happened in the pandemic was just waking up and leaving my phone in my bedroom. Um, I would wake up, I would turn off my alarm. And then there really wasn't, I didn't really felt, I didn't feel like I needed it. I didn't worry that I would miss a text, you know, that so-and-so needed something. I don't know that it was pizza day, you know, and a mom was reminding <laughs> me that I didn't need to pack the lunch. I didn't need any of those reminders. So I just left my phone in my bedroom 
And then all of a sudden the morning hours just took on a completely different quality. Wow. And I've continued that practice. Um, and it's just so, I think what you're asking, and I think maybe what I'm trying to articulate is that there is this idea of like, before, you, if you want to put on presence or these time full moments, you want to inhabit that there are things you have to put off. Yeah. There are practices you, see, you practices you put on and practices you put off. No, that's really well said. I was thinking, um, I really appreciate the subtitle of your book, which is mm -hmm. Eight Habits for Reimagining Productivity, Resisting Hurry, and Practicing Peace. I think all of us could uh, probably find that those three phrases are very inviting mm. and they resonate with something that we're hopeful for or wanting. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about those you know, three phrases, reimagining productivity, resisting hurry, practicing peace. Mm hmm. Reimagining productivity. Well, probably wouldn't have sold a lot of books if I was like throw pro throwing productivity out the window as a category. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not as popular. That's right. So we'll reimagine rather than reject. Yeah. And I think the category that I would propose, and it's not my category, I think it's just the vision of scripture. It's a kingdom vision is fruitfulness. Mm -hmm. Um Productivity is such, it's, it's just, it's like the Egyptian slave drivers, you know, for the ancient Israelites. It's like make bricks, don't care how you get it done, not going to give you straw, you've got your quota for the day do it. You know, I don't care if you're sick. I don't care if you, you know, lost your husband yesterday, like productivity is, is relent is a relentless, um, taskmaster yeah. because it just equalizes every moment and it, and it makes the ultimate goal just getting things done. So it just doesn't, it doesn't allow you to live very humanly. And interestingly enough, I mean, not unsurprisingly, the whole history of productivity was built around the machine. Of course, it was a cat. It was a measure, right? For how fast can, you know, machines produce. And of course, humans, when they're compared to machines, it just really doesn't work very well. <laughs> so fruitfulness, you know, this idea of a seasonality to life where there are wintering seasons where you don't see, you don't see grapes on the branches, but something is happening. God is mm -hmm. growing and deepening and, and strengthening and fortifying the roots. So I think that is so much more human, so much more biblical, and yeah. it allows for us to embrace seasons that don't feel very quote unquote productive, you know, where you just don't feel like you're producing it. You don't like, you can't even see the fruit, you know, but you're like, wait, maybe I'm just in a wintering season. God's always active and doing work in my life. Um, so I'll embrace that. I'll embrace if this is a season of, of roots, you know, thanks be to God. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then resisting hurry, you know, it's interesting. I I'd love See, I feel like I want to turn the tables here and I'd be like, Alan, you tell me about <laughs> <laughs> resisting hurry. Yeah. Um, I think hurry is so much about, well, first of all, like our inability to wait, which yeah. is one of the habits. Um, and God's way with us is waiting. I just think you read scripture and you're like, it seems like God never got anything done without making people wait, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> I think Different faith is sense built. Of time. Yeah. It's it's true. You know, it's interesting because so I've been reading strangely Dante's Divine Comedy. I'm actually oh. reading it for a graduate program that I'm doing. And it's interesting to see how people relate to time in Dante's vision. And there's not hurry, but there's also not like unnecessary delay. Mm -hmm. It's like there's a decisiveness about moving through the world in obedience to Christ's command and to the call to love God and love our neighbor. And I love that because I think I have, I feel like I have these dueling things that happen on the one hand, like I'm hurried, I'm impatient, I'm urgent. All I want to do is get things done. And then sometimes I wake up and this is probably like my Enneagram number <laughs> is I, sometimes I wake up feeling paralyzed that I don't even know what to do, you know? Mm. And so I'm just like, immobilized. Yeah. And I think the word decisive 
I don't know if it's the best word, but the sense of like, I can move through the world with a certain confidence when I've prayerfully discerned what it is that, you know, are my vocational callings. And again, the structure of these habits and practices, um, I have to resist distraction to do that. Yes. So it's so, so slowing down, um, doesn't may not always look like just dragging my feet through the world. Right. Yes. Um, again, I'm like, well, now I want you to say more about that. <laughs> well, what I, I thought I have, cause I'm with you. Um, you know, unhurried doesn't mean sluggish. It doesn't yes. mean non non-responsive. Uh, John Wooden, who was a famous coach for UCLA basketball in the last century used to tell his players, um, be quick, but don't hurry. Mm. I just love that little, that little teeny couplet because it gets at the fact that uh, quickness can be beautiful uh, to your, I, I kind of read in, in what you just shared a, a little bit about some perfectionism tendencies that yeah. at least I recognize in me and how paralyzing, you know, I used to think yes. that was a wonderful asset. And now I'm pretty sure it's not, <laughs> you know, Anyway, all that to say, um, I, I love the that what you're describing is there can be a kind of, you know, Jesus says, let your yes be yes. Yes. Let your no be no. Yes. Anything beyond that, it's not going to help. Yes. And um, so anyway, yeah, I love I love what you're sharing uh, about hurry. And then the the last phrase, mm. of course, is practicing peace. Mm -hmm. what, have you, what have you been learning about that? I guess I'd have to just think back to Psalm 90. And I think about mm. this kind of vision of, you know, God, <laughs> had, he's made the world. He's sustained it. He's not bound or limited by time. Like he's never wringing his hands that something didn't, you know, might not happen in the future or shouldn't have happened in the past. You know, you think about all of our anxieties as it, as they're related to time that, you know, sometimes it, it is past things, past regrets, past shames. I can't change that. Oh, you know, yeah. I don't experience, I've, I have a disquietude in my soul as related to the past, but wait, I'm invited into this greater peace, this idea like there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Jesus, that he puts our sins as far as the East is from the West, that, you know, his mercies are new every day. So there's a peace that I can experience even as related to my past, which I humanly can't change. And mm -hmm. I feel great regret over and many, I can think, I mean, everybody can think of things that, gosh, if I had, if I had a second chance, I'd do that differently. Yeah. Um, but also there's so much disquietude that we feel about the future, mm -hmm. which we know we can't control, which we can't manage, you know, which you can't guarantee that you're going to live the healthy, long life that you hope healthy, happy. You know, when you think about the American dream, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, like I don't know what tomorrow holds. And that's why I think it was so important that this kind of whole relearning about time emerged out of the pandemic because it was this global crisis that nobody controlled. And that for sure, you know, made me think, I, I think it, it helped me to see how often I look to achieve peace by control yeah. That so long as I can kind of manage the outcomes, avoid kind of the inevitability or the contingencies, you know, that might be there in the future. OK, I feel peaceful, but can I feel at peace when I'm dumped into a day that just is turned upside down or yeah. a year or 10 years? Yeah. You know uh, what? And I think in Jesus Christ, who is our peace? That has to be available to us somehow. And I long for it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate some of what you were sharing about anxiety, because for me, um, the more I talk with leaders about hurry, the more I realize that a very common variety of hurry for leaders is anxiety and yeah. its companion control or imagined control. Yes. And as you say, sometimes it's directed backwards, uh, regrets, ruminating, whatever about the thing that just happened or happened a while back. A lot of it is is under the guise of planning 
And so we're, you know, we're making our five-year plans, <laughs> having no idea where we'll be in yes. the year 2028, you know, oh my goodness, after the last <laughs> two or three. Um, so that anxiety mm. um, becomes an engine uh, for hurry, or it is a variety of of hurry. And yeah. it's really the opposite, I think, of practicing the presence of God in this moment. Yes. So sort of today is the day of salvation. Right yes. Now. Uh, salvation isn't tomorrow yet. It's today. Um, I don't <laughs> yes. have to import tomorrow into today. Jesus said, leave the worrying about tomorrow to tomorrow. That's its job. Yeah. Just all those sorts of things. Uh, I say all mm. that because I know one of your phrases, you you quote the idea of time anxiety. Like literally, yes. uh, we we many of us carry within us a very anxious view of time. I wonder if you can just think out loud a little more about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think even, you know, I've mentioned the past and the future, but I think even time anxiety about the present mm -hmm. um, with the proliferation of choice that we have today in the modern world, you know, like we, I mean, just everything from breakfast cereal to I'm a woman. So the concealer that I can wear under my mm. eyes to the jeans I can buy to the schools I can choose for my kids to the churches I can attend to the books that I can read. I can literally feel panicked huh. about choosing a book because I feel my own limitations. And I'm like, is this the best book? Is this the best book for now? You know, I mean, these, the, the responsibilities, you know, when we think we exist in time and these choices are so con consequential. And um, so our anxieties, I see this, especially in young people, my old Older children are 20, 21, 20, and 18. And this anxiety that I think is a time anxiety because it's like, but what is best right now? You know, this feeling yeah. of like the meaning of now and how do I choose for the now, you know, and also for the next year. And um, so I think coming to terms with the paradox of choosing in the Christian life, which is a great paradox. I mean, it's one of these tensions that we inhabit. So, you know, I've been, I also have been thinking a lot about Mary and Martha. Oh, yeah. And I think one of the reasons why I, I think that's a great medit, you know, a great story to invite us into thinking about our own distractions, our own hurry. You know, you have a very typical way of talking about that story, Martha. She's worried and distracted by many things. And right. Mary, the contemplative, you know, has chosen the better portion and that will not be taken from her. Oh, mm -hmm. I could talk a lot about that because that's the phrase that's been resonating with me the last couple of months, a uh, couple of weeks. I've been thinking about this for years and years. And I think I've always felt like it it can so easily be reduced into, you know, Martha's good and uh, Martha's bad. I'm sorry. And Mary's good. Right. But what is, but it can't be that Martha's activity is bad, you know, okay. the, in the work of hospitality, of because not. that seems to be great. You know, she welcomed Jesus into her home. She was fixing dinner, making it possible for people to gather around the table. You know, she's showing hospitality. She's she's giving of her resources and her energy um, to something very good. So it can't be that the activity is bad. So what is it? And as I thought about that story, I've thought about how Mar Martha's resentment, this idea of like, oh, this is good work and Mary's not helping me with it. And as an Enneagram one, I can say a lot about resentment, you know, a lot about <laughs> choosing things, feeling sort of left to do things on my own and mad that, you know, people don't help me, but I never ask and right. And really, I've just taken on probably too much. But then Mar Mary, what is it that she's doing? She's sitting at Jesus' feet. And I think this idea of like, she's chosen the better portion. And I do think the paradox of the Christian life somehow is about this idea of our choosing that on the one hand, we live and move and have our being in God and God's providences in our lives, which we all know are innumerable. We only see, you know, a glimpse of how God is sovereign and provident in our lives, doing things that we never choose, making it possible for us to have 
light and for our feet to walk the path that is Jesus, the way that is Jesus. But on the other hand, like we do have some agency, right? And yes. we we have an ability to choose or not choose, to decide or not decide um, in many regards. And I think that Christian discipleship is so often about like firming up and fortifying that inner will. So like Dante, I love how, as he progresses, you know, he moves from Inferno to purgatory to, to paradise. And what's happening is that his will is being strengthened and purified Mm -hmm. to choose what God wants. Um, so the anxiety piece of that for me, like I, I have a lot of anxiety about choosing. I really do. Oh, I, yeah. I, I worry about my incapacity to discern. Um, I often second guess my decisions and these are very paralyzing in the midst of time. And so that's where you're supposed to help me, <laughs> but that's my thinking aloud about my own anxieties, I guess. No, I, I really resonate with that. I, I know for me, the longer I go, I'm, I'm now in my sixties, you know, so actually this month I will have been in paid ministry 40 years wow. to the month. That's and amazing. I think of the first couple decades and how much anxiety ran my life and drove mm. my work. I just don't know if we realize how often anxiety is the motor that's yeah. driving a lot of what we do <clears throat> yes. and that actually peace would be a much better motor <laughs> yeah. than anxiety would. Mm. Um, but, but that doesn't come quickly. It comes over time. And I think maybe one of the words I really liked, you know, your eight practices, you use a word or phrase, I think it's a phrase, maybe it's just one word each, but one of them, you talk about the practice of receive. Yeah. Now receive, that's a very different vision of life than achieve is or produce, at least our limited vision of produce, receive is a different orientation. Can you say some about what you've been learning in this practice of receiving, receptivity? Mm -hmm. Well, I charted this in my pandemic journal. So early in the pandemic, people were saying, keep a plague journal. And, you know, this is going to be your historical record. And of course, I'm like very dutiful, like, yes, I will. I will keep this journal. (laughs) But, and I, as I was rereading it and just kind of looking at the arc of it, I would say, I realized that what early in the pandemic, what I wanted to do is I wanted to manage the crisis. I wanted to manage my own self in the crisis. Like I was like, how are we going to just get back to normal? And, you know, I would literally say things in my journal, like today was a good day. I got a lot of things done and I felt really productive. And yeah. I was reassuring myself early in the pandemic, like, no, I can do this thing. You know, I can do this thing so long as I can maintain the rhythms and the kind of outward, the motion. Like what I was doing is I was actually simulating motion in my house. <laughs> it was it was crazy. Of course, I didn't see it for a while, but yeah. that started to ebb. And I would say that I can I can see it in my journal where I just start to res- what happens is I actually start just recording gratitude things. That was kind of the practice. It was just like, oh, you know, it was just great to take a walk around the block and um notice the leaves falling. You know, we were we were living in Toronto at the time, which was the longest North American lockdown. So we were oh boy. we were home more than anybody else um on the on the um continent. So I had, you know, you had to actually really look for things. You had to look for new things. You had to look for new things to receive. And once I started to just kind of change my practice, like I just going to look for things to be grateful for and write those down. All of a sudden it's like the gifts are falling from the sky and I'm recording them and the days aren't mine to manage. They're mine to receive. And again, it wasn't that I gave up on like, well, you know, I won't do anything. I'll just sit on the couch and hope to receive life. It was like, I still, I, I don't think temperamentally, you know, I'm all that different. I think I am wired to be kind of moving through the world, you know, pretty actively. Yeah. Um, but the, the what had burned off, I guess, was that urgency, that false urgency. I actually said to somebody um, when we moved to Cincinnati, a new friend, um, you know, she was like, 
Oh, I met her at church and she was like, Oh, this is, Oh, you know, I've read your books. And this is, and this is actually, it was kind of funny because I literally never have encounters like this. No one recognizes me. No one knows me, <laughs> but it just so happened that at this church, this woman had um, read some of my books and she recognized me and she said, Oh, this is going to be so great. Like, how are you going to serve here? Like what a blessing for the church or whatever. And I was like, you know what, to be honest, I'm going to feel falsely urgent about nothing. <laughs> I've moved here to care for my mom. I'm going to get my kids settled into school and I'm going to be urgent about nothing else. You know, uh, whatever I'm going to just look to receive whatever invitations God has. It's just a completely different way. And it, it, it means even, like I said, this morning I had to receive the interruption that my mom has COVID Thankfully she's, um, she's well, like she's not, I don't worry about her health, but she's quarantined in her apartment for 11 days and she has dementia. And so that's very hard because she's not able to do things for herself as long as she's sort of out and about, you know, she follows people who she's able to get some help, but now like the staff won't be in her apartment. And So it's just, I had to go over there today and just help her with some things. Um, And then I realized, and do you want to know the truth, Alan, is when I got the call that she had COVID and that she would be quarantined, um, at first I heard from the nurse, um, Mm. I thought to myself, oh, going to have a couple of weeks that I'm going to like, just, I'm going to feel like she's, I won't have to like attend to her so much, you know, Mm. she'll be safe there. And yeah. Um, and then I realized, no, actually I'm gonna have to be there twice a day to help her administer medication and just do all these different things. And it's hard to receive that. It's hard to receive it when you have a long list of things that you feel like you do need to get done. Um, so I think receive is about trust. It's about trusting that whatever comes to me today, like it's coming through God's hands. Um, However, that works, you know, I mean, I don't believe that God, you know, visits suffering on people because he's just mean and, you know, capriciously visiting people with suffering, you know, but I think somehow in his, I have to trust his providence and trust that today as interrupted as the morning felt like, well, you know, whatever's on my list that won't get done, it obviously didn't need to get done. And something will be put off or I'll be given energy, more energy or different time tomorrow or later in the week. And so, yeah, this whole it's just a whole new way of trusting, I guess, trusting that the time is sufficient for what is needed. Absolutely. Yeah, I I love, you know, your your language of receive. It's it's receptivity to me. It's the language of grace. You yeah. know, li- lived grace, not just theological, doctrinal uh, mm-hmm. grace, not grace to argue about, uh, but but actually yeah. grace to receive and then share. And I think the thing is, we hear grace, and sometimes I think we imagine that that must mean just lots and lots of good things I like. Ray for <laughs> grace. Yes. And we're not open as much to some of the darker <laughs> shades of grace uh... that cross our paths. And some of those, as you say, you know, have a way of um, feeling more like interruption than gift. Yes. Um, more like um, something that's destroying my day instead of being a, an opportunity to be the hands, the feet, the voice, the heart of Jesus in a particular moment. So I love mm. the idea of receiving my day. And, and I've been experimenting with that a little bit. Of course, I make a plan. Uh, sure. I'm a I'm a list guy. I love planning ahead <laughs> yeah. and I love checking them off. And I but I think one of the things that's helped me, and I wonder if, mm. if any of this echoes for you, but I realized what I needed to let go of was the sense it's the classic Henry Nowen insight. Uh, I am not what I do. I am not yeah. what I acquire. I am not what people say of me. Mm. Actually, it's the reverse. I do out of who I am. I enter into the world with something to give it. Uh, because it's been given me. And so productivity isn't somewhere that I prove my worth. Uh, Productivity is a place I express my worth. Mm -hmm. And there's a great freedom. There's a great unhurrying, I think, in that vision. Suddenly, I can actually be more fruitful because I don't desperately need fruitfulness to prove I'm worth something today. Yeah, that just absolutely. That has just been a... uh, this has been a treadmill 
uh, identity treadmill for me mm. when I'm when I'm so attached to my vision of what productivity will look like in a day or a week or or whatever. Mm-hmm. I wonder how that strikes you. Well, I was thinking about Jesus' words um, about abide, you know, abide in me and let my words abide in you. And, you know, you're going to bear much fruit. This brings my father great glory that you be fruitful. So it's like God actually wants us to be fruitful. This is nothing we have to, you know, bargain with God for, or beg him for. He wants for our fruitfulness because that actually, that brings him glory. And I think it feeds the world. You know, I think the other thing that we also forget about fruitfulness, it's not just like the vine doesn't need the fruit. It's the birds that need the fruit, right? It's the squirrels that need the fruit. It's the world that needs the fruit of Christians' lives. Um, so it brings yes. God's glory. It brings him glory to see his people the hands and feet of Jesus, as you've already said, feeding the world, literally and metaphorically. Um, but how do you grow in fruitfulness? Um, you don't, you don't like Ooh, really try really hard, you know, you abide, right. you like you abide. And that's not, um, you know, that's not nothing. I think there's again, a choosing, there's a choosing, um, involved in abiding. Um, but there's a lot of just like, stay put, rest, remain, persevere, endure. I thought about that passage a lot, actually, when I was writing the book and just thinking about fruitfulness and really curious about how that word got translated in lots of different Bible translations. And I was so encouraged to think about, it's not just abide in the vine, it's endure in the vine and persevere in the vine. Mm. And I will endure and persevere in you. Whoa. Like, it's just, it's just so beautiful. And it's just, and there's something so daily about it too. Yes. I think one of the things, and again, one of the distortions that we live with in a technological age is we like tasks that are once and done, once and done, you know, like I set a reminder and my phone just beeps or whatever. And I never have to think about it again. Right. Well, guess what? Like abiding is like, it's just a daily thing. It's like a moment by moment thing. Um, And it is an act of trust too, again, Mm -hmm. because fruitfulness is just not always evident because of what season you might be in. Um, And so I think when we remind people that you can abide in Jesus and you can be assured of your fruitfulness, and you may also be in a wintering season where what's happening is your, your roots are going deep. And just because you don't see grapes doesn't mean God's not at work. Yeah. uh, That's so good. You know, living here in California, of course, we can visit all kinds of uh, wine mm. regions uh, here nearby and, and elsewhere in the state. And, you know, when you're looking at a vineyard, most of the times what you notice is if it's fall, you're noticing the remarkable fruit and the harvest of it. Or if it's spring and summer, you're noticing the beautiful greenery that's mm. growing and the rows and rows and rows of vines. But almost nobody comments on the little spot where the branch and the vine meet. Mm. That is singularly unimpressive. And yet that without that little place, yeah. none of the rest of it exists. And so it gets back to your, you know, your highlighting Jesus invitation to, uh, to abide, to endure, uh, to persevere, to rest at home in mm-hmm. um, all of those sorts of things. Um, the last little uh, question I have before we close our conversation in one of your chapters, you have a time practice of offering. Uh, And you mentioned in that chapter, the idea that vocation, in a sense, I think vocation is another one of those words like abiding. It's just a very simple, mundane sort of word, but that vocation begins with rest. Now that's, that's a little counterintuitive, I think for some, uh, for some of us, to some of our ears, Uh, but I couldn't agree more. Can you say more about what that's been looking like for you? Mm Hmm. Well, that came to me from AJ Swoboda's book, Subversive Sabbath, where he really takes it. Oh, I love that book. I think that I also read that during the pandemic. And just this idea of like, look at God, you know, he's preparing his co-regents, right? He's going to send Adam and out, Adam and Eve out into the world to like tend the garden. And the first day is the day of rest. It's like, you're all yeah. ready to go and you're going to rest. You're not going to work <laughs> on the first, <laughs> the first day. 
How beautiful is that? I mean, I think what rest does is it just right sizes whatever work we're offering in the world. When we work perpetually without pause, it is usually because we are depending on the efforts of our own work to like hold up the world, you know, like if I don't answer my email or if I don't, um, I mean, whatever it is, you know, if I don't do that on um, that's, you know, day of rest, then things will fall apart. And I think it's, it's an overly exaggerated kind of confidence in what our work is accomplishing. And so rest is always related to our idea of our own work's importance and value and worth. And it is, I think, valuable and I think important. It's just not messianic. (laughs) Um, I remember Leland Riken reading a book a long time ago about essentially like you can't think about rest rightly until you think about work rightly. Mm-hmm. And you can't think about work rightly unless you think about rest rightly. These commands are, these are dual commands in one command. Six days you shall labor. And, you know, on the seventh, you shall take your rest. And so it's a command to work and a command to rest. And I think, oh, we have a lot of distorted views about both, right? Yes, you know, we sure do. Sometimes we only imagine rest as like, oh, I, you know, fall asleep in front of my TV or go on a two week vacation or something. You know, we don't have an idea of rest as practice. And I also think sometimes that we don't know about diligence either in work. Um, Mm. I write about, you know, wanting shortcuts, I think, which we all do. We want to just, our work to be done quickly, effortlessly, and it takes a lot of faith and patient faith to cultivate a vocation that that is lifelong. Yeah, no, absolutely. I I, I appreciate that, you know, your vision. I, I love AJ's language, you know, about, uh, Sabbath in that book there. And I quote him a number of times uh, along the way. Mm. Uh, he's just done such good work there. And, and that idea that, you know, Sabbath may be the last in creation, but it's the first in intention. Mm. Uh, that that's, uh, that's an old rabbi way of understanding it. Oh, that's beautiful. So I would love if you just let our listeners know, how can they find out more about your books and about your work? One of the things I do is I just send a letter every Monday on um, through Substack um, to people who want to subscribe to my Substack. It's called Postscript. So if you go to Substack and you look for me, like you can sign up to get a letter from me every week. And they range from everything to funny stories that's hap- that are happening in my house to biblical reflections to, you know, just, I don't know thoughts on things that are happening in the world. Um, So there's quite a variety there. That's kind of the best way. Truthfully, I'm a little bit fitfully engaged on social media, probably (laughs) mostly on Instagram. You know, that's where you'd find me most. But when I say most, it might be like three posts a month. (laughs) So I'm not really very active on social media a little bit more. I've been a little bit more recently with the book, but, um, but you can go to my website, And if you don't want a monthly, if you don't want a weekly letter, you can sign up on my website for a monthly letter, just five things that I'm learning. Hmm. Um, And you can, yeah, get some freebies too. Lots of freebies. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for that. I wonder if as, as we close, could I ask you maybe just to share a word of encouragement or a word of invitation to our listeners, kind of in the spirit of this book that you've written? Mm Hmm. It takes time to be human. Yeah. And it takes time to move through the world in humane ways. And Psalm 1 is probably one of the best visions of the time it takes to grow a deeply formed life that, you know, is deeply rooted in the groundwater of God's love that, you know, learns the wisdom available to those of us who follow Jesus Christ. You don't grow an oak overnight. (laughs) And I think the tree that is figured for us in Psalm 1 and in other places in scripture, I think there's a reason why the tree is often the image of the flourishing human life. Mm. Because it takes time to grow a tree. 
and it takes a lifetime. Um, and so I think just being realistic about the time it takes to grow a marriage, grow a friendship, parent a child, care for an aging parent, love Jesus, love your neighbor, cultivate a vocation. Like these things take time and you're not doing it wrong when progress is an overnight. <laughs> well, those are gracious and inviting words. I really appreciate it. Again, today, our guest has been Jen Pollock, Michelle, and we've been talking about her book in good time. Jen, it's really been a pleasure to talk with you today. Oh, it's been such a delight. Thank you, Alan. I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. In the next few episodes, we'll be talking with authors Jay Kim, Kelly Capick, and Roger Parrott. I can't wait to share those episodes with you. Now, if you'd like to receive more help from Unhurried Living, I invite you to join our Unhurried Daily email list. For 40 days, we'll send you a brief daily email that offers personal reflections from life and scripture to help you take the next step in following Jesus's unhurried way. You can sign up on our website at unhurriedliving.com. We're honored to encourage thousands of leaders just like you. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Unhurried Living Podcast. Join us next time to learn more about following the genius of Jesus's unhurried way of life and leadership.